Hello. My name is D. And I'm a 60-year-old woman. My husband passed away about 5 years ago. But I'm still a working woman. I have 5 kids. 4 of whom live in different states across the country. They each have their own families. And I feel beyond blessed to have such a large family. One of my kids. Jack. Still lives in our hometown. He attended the community college here. Where he met his wife. Riley. I liked her. But I didn't think my opinion mattered as long as Jack was happy. The two of them got married quite soon and. Pursued further education in their respective fields. When they secured good jobs and earned enough. They decided to have a child. I was excited because that meant I had one more grandchild to spoil. However. Riley was always very particular about me meeting my grandchild. Jason. She had strict rules about when I could visit and for how long. Initially. I understood due to the baby being young. But even when he turned six. It remained odd. Nevertheless. I respected their boundaries. Recognizing that every family functions differently. Before I knew it. Twelve years had passed. Due to the limited interaction I was allowed with Jason. I didn't have the opportunity to build a strong bond with him. Yet. I did notice that we both shared a genuine love for books. Whenever I did get the chance to visit. I made sure to bring him books that I knew he'd enjoy. One day while I was at work. I received an unexpected call from Jason. It was peculiar for various reasons. Especially considering that Jason and I rarely spoke outside of family gatherings. I did my best to connect with him. Similar to how I had with my other grandchildren. But he always seemed too distant. Grandma. Are you free to talk? Jason's voice trembled on the line. Yes. Honey. Any time for you. Tell me. Is everything okay? No. No. Why are you crying? Did you get hurt? Is there anybody at home who can help you? Mom and dad are here. But do you need me to call them for you? No. I called you because I needed your help. My help? What do you mean? Darling? I need you to save me. Grandma. What are you talking about? Jason? Don't laugh. Grandma. Grandma. I'm sorry. That wasn't what I was expecting you to say. I'm not kidding. If you won't help me. I'll find another way. No. Hold on. I'm sorry for laughing. Now. Why don't you explain what you meant? I need you to save me from my devil mother. Devil mother? Honey. What do you mean? She's not as sweet and nice as she acts. She's really mean to me when no one's around. And she keeps, oh no. I hear someone coming up the stairs. I have to go. Please don't tell them that I've called. Bye. I was confused and concerned. As far as I knew. Riley was one of the sweetest people I knew. How could Jason call her a devil? I didn't believe him at the time because. I figured it was just him trying to get back at Riley. After all. She probably grounded him for something he had done. As far as I knew from what both Riley and Jack had told me. Jason had been a pretty mischievous child. But I had this nagging feeling in my gut that Jason was not joking around. As I went home that day. I couldn't stop thinking about the conversation. It was very out of character for Jason to say such things. I slept on it for a couple of days. But I still couldn't rid myself of the feeling that something was up. So. I decided to make an impulsive purchase and ordered a hidden camera. Of course. I felt wrong spying on my son and his family. But I justified it by telling myself that I was only. Doing it because Jason explicitly asked for my help. If. 
And hopefully there wasn't. Something wrong. I could just retrieve the camera. But if there was. Then I'd have to figure out what exactly needed to be done. I hoped that even if there was something happening. A long talk would solve the issue. The camera took a couple of days to arrive. And after it did. I set it up. Thankfully. This camera I purchased had the capability to. Stream live footage as well as record. Accessing the footage through an app on my. Phone made it incredibly convenient. Once I had set it up and figured out its technicalities. I decided to call my son and inquire if I could visit. Hello. Sweetie. How's everything? Everything's great. Mom. What about you? It's the same old. Same old. Although I was wondering about something and I thought I'd ask you about it. Yeah. Of course. Is everything okay? Yes. Yes. I was just thinking that we haven't met in a long time. And I was wondering if I could just swing by your place one day. Yes. Of course. Mom. How about this Sunday? That works. But shouldn't you maybe check with Riley if that's okay? Lord knows I hated it when your dad made plans without asking me about it. I know Riley would be really happy to have you over. Don't worry. Mom. Alright then. I'll be there around 5. Zero, 00. That works. See you soon. Take care. Even though I had ulterior motives for going to Jack's place. I was genuinely excited to spend time with my son. Considering I never really saw the rest of my family until the holiday season. It felt nice to have one of my children staying in the same town. I tried my best not to intrude because they were living their own lives. The weekend came quickly. I got ready early and thought it might be nice to take something over to their place. I went to the grocery store, picked up a nice bottle of wine, and bought a couple of books for Jason because I knew he loved to read. Upon arriving at my son's house, I was warmly greeted by all three of them. Jason looked at me with such relief that I became concerned again. He hadn't attempted to contact me after that initial phone call. So I had no way of knowing what he was going to say when he hung up. I spent the next couple of hours just talking to Jack and Riley. We had dinner and drank wine at some point. Jason excused himself to his room as the conversation. Shifted to topics perhaps too mature for his liking feeling it was essential to connect with Jason. I excused myself from the discussion. Riley attempted to subtly dissuade me. But I persisted. It had been a considerable amount of time since my last visit. And I felt it was crucial to spend quality time with my grandson. Jack intervened. Curtailing whatever Riley was about to say. And encouraged me to engage with Jason. As I entered his room. I closed the door behind me, creating a space for an intimate conversation. I approached Jason, offering him the books I had picked out for him. Our discussion centered around these books, a conversation he eagerly initiated. He was genuinely enthusiastic, sharing his thoughts and excitement about them. And I encouraged him to elaborate. Despite Jason hinting at something earlier. I refrained from bringing it up intentionally, allowing him to open up at his own pace. My aim was to create a comfortable environment where Jason could share his thoughts willingly. As our conversation veered towards various aspects of our lives, including Jason sharing updates about school and other interests, he discreetly reached for one of his notebooks and began jotting down a message. He silently showed it to me. The words scrawled on the page. Mom's listening. Can't talk about anything. It struck a chord with a mix of concern and uncertainty. Unsure if it was a serious warning or merely Jason feeling cautious. Respecting his indication. I continued our conversation while discreetly noting. 
down my plan in the same notebook. Explaining to him about the hidden camera I had brought along. I sought his permission to install it in his room. He appeared agitated but readily agreed. Carefully finding a suitable spot in the room to discreetly place the camera. I ensured it offered a comprehensive view. After setting up the recording device, I lingered a while longer with Jason before realizing the time and expressing that I should head home, leaving my scarf behind inadvertently. I used it as an excuse for a possible return in the future. As I bid goodbye to Jason, I sensed hurried footsteps retreating from the door, triggering a faint suspicion regarding Jason's apprehensions. Despite this, I didn't give it much thought at the time and departed after bidding Jack and Riley farewell. Exhausted upon reaching home, I diligently reviewed the footage captured by the camera. I stayed awake for an hour, engrossed in reading, while keeping a vigilant eye on the footage, anticipating any developments. However, the recording revealed only the moment. When my son entered Jason's room and queried him about our conversation, Jason informed me about the situation. And subsequently, I dozed off. The following morning, in my haste to get to work, I neglected to check the cameras. It wasn't until I was certain Jason had returned from school that I finally took a look. Once again, there seemed to be nothing significant leading me to consider that Jason might have been fabricating things. I resolved to wait one more day, planning to retrieve the camera when both Jack and Riley were out, and ask Jason to return it. However, that night, while I was reading and monitoring the footage, I discovered what Jason had been attempting to convey. I observed Riley entering the room wielding a stick, with Jack following closely. Swiftly, I unmuted the video and overheard Riley, questioning Jason about his activities throughout the entire day. She demanded an excruciatingly detailed account from him, insisting he narrate every moment in extreme specificity. Whenever he stumbled or hesitated, she sharply interrogated him, questioning the truthfulness of his words. If she suspected deceit, she made him extend his palms, subjecting him to two or three swift strikes against his knuckles. Witnessing this, my dismay and horror grew as the frequency of her reprimands escalated. Jason was in tears. And Jack, to my disappointment and disgust, stood there passively observing. It clashed deeply with my approach to parenting. I'd always raised my children with gentle guidance rarely resorting to raised voices, believing that children comprehend more than we often credit them for. While reasoning might not always work, explaining things usually does. It baffled me that Jack would allow his son to endure such unnecessary punishment. I felt an urge to rush to their place and intervene. But what could I possibly say? Returning just a day after my previous visit would undoubtedly raise suspicion. Recollecting that I'd left my scarf behind offered a possible excuse. But it seemed insufficient. However, I realized it could serve as a pretext to meet with Jason. Taking up my phone, I decided to call Jack instead. Hi. Mom. Everything alright? Jack's voice came through the phone. No worries. Dear. You're not disturbing me. I replied. Just checking in. Riley and I were bidding goodnight to Jason. Ah. I see. All right then. I wanted to tell you that I think I left my scarf in Jason's room last night. I distinctly recall placing it there and then. In my absent-mindedness. I forgot to take it with me. Do you think I could swing by tomorrow to pick it up? Jack offered. Why don't I come over right now and drop it off for you? Feeling fatigued. I declined. No. I'm quite exhausted. 
I'll probably fall asleep before you even arrive. It's been a long day at work. And I can barely hold the phone steady. Fair enough. How about you come by tomorrow evening? Jack suggested. I can't do that either. I've planned to meet some friends for game night tomorrow. I explained. Riley and I won't be back until evening, could I swing by the day after? I need the scarf for tomorrow. We're having a sort of gathering. Jack proposed an afternoon visit. Well. You could come by in the afternoon. Jason will be home. Great. I'll be there around two. Good night. Mom. Jack said. Concluding our conversation. My heart raced as I fabricated excuses on the spot. Although my call distracted Jack and Riley enough to steer their attention away from hitting Jason. I couldn't bear the reality that Riley declared Jason would go without any meals until dinner the following day. It appalled me to think that they would follow through with this punishment. Based on what I'd witnessed. Anticipating a difficult conversation. I took the next day off from work. Mentally preparing myself for the discussion I needed to have with Jason. I was certain he wouldn't want to remain there. But I needed to hear it from him. Before heading to Jack's place. I made sure to collect some food for both Jason and myself. Upon arriving. Jason appeared on the verge of collapsing at any moment. A weariness evident in his demeanor. He appeared weak and utterly lethargic. Riley had indeed enforced her dictum of denying him food. I swiftly handed him his meal. Observing as he devoured it voraciously. My heart ached for him. And I was determined to make things better for him. Once he finished eating. I initiated a conversation. Did you see everything that happened? Yes. Grandma. And I'm so sorry for laughing at you earlier. I had no idea. No. It's okay. Sweetheart. I know mom seems like the nicest person. But has she always been this way? The beatings only started recently. But the starvation has been going on for a while. I just need to get a clearer understanding. Could you tell me why Jack isn't doing anything? He's too scared of mom. He just follows her everywhere and listens to everything she says. Everything she wants. She gets. Oh. Honey. I'm so sorry you've been dealing with this for a while. But I am curious. Why didn't you eat anything at school? Mom didn't send me to school on days that she doesn't let me eat. I stay home. Mom measures how much of each food is there in the house. And if it's even one gram off when she gets back. I get punished. So. She's starving you and jeopardizing your education. I'm definitely going to do my best to help you out. Okay. I need you to tell me right now if you would like to come live with me. I'll take care of everything you need and keep you away from mom and dad. Of course. Grandma. Anywhere away from here will be great. I promise to only be good. Please take me away from here. I promise I will. Darling. But it will take some time. Do you think you can handle staying here for a little while longer? Yeah. I can. I've been living here for 12 years. So I can wait a little more. I meticulously removed all the wrappers and ensured no trace of food remained there. I was determined not to let Riley exacerbate Jason's situation further. After assisting Jason in tidying up any crumbs, I meticulously checked and rechecked to ensure. We left Jack's place exactly as it was before. Returning home, I made sure to call Jack, expressing gratitude for retrieving my forgotten scarf and acknowledging his cooperation. Subsequently, I reached out to a close friend who specialized in family law. After detailing my circumstances to him, he explained the arduous and lengthy process of fighting for custody of Jason. 
he cautioned that even if I managed to obtain temporary custody, a judge might reconsider granting Riley custody again if her behavior changed during that period. Considering the scarcity of evidence I had, contesting custody in court seemed unfavorable. However, I recognized a potential alternative. With the evidence I had gathered, I could pursue becoming Jason's legal guardian instead. Riley held a counseling position at a local middle school. I was confident she wouldn't want her abusive actions to jeopardize her job or future prospects. With this strategy in mind, I meticulously monitored the footage over the next few days, gathering evidence and preparing the necessary paperwork for a transfer of guardianship. Choosing a weekend without prior notice, I decided to visit Jack's place. When he answered the door, he appeared surprised to see me. Mom. What brings you here? I need to talk to you and Riley. I replied. Uh. I don't think now's a good time. Jack hesitated. Curious. I pressed. Why? What's going on? Just family stuff. Jack replied evasively. Unconvinced. I questioned his sudden concern. How come you're suddenly over so frequently? He stumbled. Can't I visit my son? I didn't think I needed special permission to do that. Jack clarified. No. I didn't mean it that way. It's just that you've taken a sudden interest in us this week. And it's unusual because you rarely dropped by before. I assure you. It isn't really weird. I replied. Masking my intentions for the unexpected visits. Today's visit was prompted by a matter of utmost importance that I needed to discuss with the two of you. I stated, attempting to remain composed. What's that sound? Jack's evasiveness raised my suspicions. I recognized the undertone in his voice. An uneasiness that confirmed my fears about Riley's treatment of Jason. The unmistakable sound of intense. Crying emanating from Jason's room jolted me into action. Without hesitation, I pushed past Jack and hurried into the house. The thought of standing idly by while Jason suffered was inconceivable. I raced, or rather moved briskly given my age, toward Jason's room and forcefully swung the door open. My resolve was unwavering, I had to protect him. As I burst in, I was confronted with a distressing sight. Jason sobbing inconsolably. His hands cradling his face. Riley stood nearby. Visibly agitated. Exuding an unsettling malice that made me shiver. Instinctively. I rushed to Jason's side. Embracing him tightly while inquiring about his well-being. He clung to me. Tears streaming down his face. Riley unmoved, haughtily walked away, showing no remorse. When Jason finally calmed down, I inspected him more closely. His cheek was visibly red and swelling. His knuckles bore signs of bleeding, and his arms displayed welts, a result of the stick. I was consumed by an unprecedented rage. What kind of abomination could inflict such? Brutal treatment on an innocent child. Nothing could justify subjecting a child to such cruelty. Summoning all the composure I could muster, I swiftly went downstairs to the kitchen, grabbing a bag of frozen vegetables. Returning to Jason's room, I offered him the cold pack to alleviate the swelling on his cheeks. Once I ensured Jason's immediate comfort and safety, I informed him that I would be taking him to my place that day. I urged him to pack as many of his belongings as possible. With that resolved, I descended to confront both Jack and Riley. Prepared for a difficult conversation, Riley appeared furious, and Jack seemed visibly uncomfortable, perhaps wishing to be anywhere else at that moment. How dare you just barge into our home that way? 
Isn't it a good thing that I did? You are hitting your child. For crying out loud. What I do in my family is none of your business. Your child is my grandson. And he is a part of my family too. You're hurting him. And I can't let that go on. He may be your grandson. But you don't live with him. You don't know what a brat he is. I'm just disciplining him. Who cares if he's a brat? He's a child. And there are so many other ways to discipline a child rather than hitting them. I mean. You of all people should know this. Listen. I don't believe in any of that gentle parenting crap. Leave me and my family alone. You got it. I'm afraid I can't do that. What do you mean? I handed Riley the papers necessary to transfer guardianship rights to me. Both she and Jack stared at the papers in utter confusion. I clarified that they both had to sign the papers. Or I would expose the evidence I had of them hitting Jason. What do you mean by proof? I set up a hidden camera in Jason's room last week. And I have all the proof I need. Neither of your jobs will appreciate what you guys do. Especially yours. Riley. If you want to have any income at all. I suggest that you sign the papers. You were spying on us. That's a gross violation of our privacy. Don't get me wrong. But I was only acting on information that I had. I needed to make sure Jason was doing alright. Mom. Don't do this to us. Give us another chance. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. I don't want to hear any of it. I'm very disappointed in you. Jack. I raised you to be better than this. Your actions are just as despicable as Riley's. If not more, I reproached. Confronting Jack about his role in the abhorrent treatment of Jason. My resolve was firm, I was taking Jason with me. And I expected the necessary legal papers to be signed promptly. The unspoken implications hung in the air. Neither Jack nor Riley dared to challenge the gravity of the situation. There was an understanding that failure. To comply would lead to dire consequences. Without resistance. Jason and I left their residence. I made it a point to provide Jason with solace and reassurance. Taking him out for dinner and ice cream. Creating a safe space for him to express. His feelings without fear became a priority. In the ensuing weeks. The legal process granted me guardianship of Jason. Riley and Jack. Citing plans to relocate to another. State and a desire not to disrupt Jason's education. Did not contest the transfer of guardianship. Their subsequent move brought a sense of relief. Jason. In the aftermath. Seemed to thrive. Displaying a brighter and happier demeanor. The absence of his parents significantly improved his well-being. Revealing a kinder and more affectionate side to his personality. Today. Jason is flourishing. He exudes gratitude daily for the shelter and protection I've provided. My promise to safeguard him remains unwavering. He's emerged as one of the most compassionate and gentle kids I've ever known. I'm committed to upholding my pledge to shield him for the entirety of my life. Thank you for listening. Let's enjoy another similar story. Hey Eric. Mommy's back. I exclaimed. Walking in with enthusiasm. Yay. Where's daddy? Eric's innocent excitement took an unexpected turn. Eric's discomfort was palpable as he averted his gaze and mumbled. Um. I don't know. Sensing something amiss. I probed gently. What's going on? Love. Are you keeping secrets with mommy? Eric remained silent but continued to stare anxiously at the floor. My concern grew. Prompting me to call my husband. David. Immediately. Where are you? I came for a vacation with our son. He replied. I swiftly ended the call. Signaling Eric to pack his bags. 
something felt off. And I knew we needed to leave the house urgently. My name is Caroline. And I'm 40 years old. David. My husband. Is 42. We've shared a happy marriage for the past decade. We initially met at the same office where. We worked together and eventually fell in love. Eric. Our eight-year-old son. Completed our family. Soon after we got married. David received a promising offer from another company. Prompting him to switch jobs. I continued to work in the same company. Steadily climbing the ranks to a. Senior position that required occasional business trips. When Eric was three. I was offered a promotion. Contingent upon periodic travel for work. I hesitated due to Eric's young age. But David was unwavering in his support. Don't worry. Honey. I'll take care of Eric. But Eric is too small. I expressed my concern. He's my son too. Besides. It's only for a few days. David reassured me. With David's unyielding support. I accepted the promotion. Grateful for his care and commitment. In looking after Eric whenever I traveled for work. Our lives unfolded smoothly until a pivotal moment. A call from my father-in-law altered the trajectory of our family dynamic. Hey David. I've been contemplating stepping down from the business. I can no longer handle the stress. My father-in-law began. Is everything okay? Dad? David responded. Concern lacing his tone. Yeah. Everything's fine. It's just that I'm getting older. You know. It's time for you to take over the business. My father-in-law explained. David. Maintaining his composure. Politely responded. Dad. You know I've worked hard to carve out my own identity. Now you're asking me to leave everything and join your business. David. You knew this was inevitable. I've let you do as you pleased until now. But this is something you should do for the family. His father persisted. You can't force me. Dad. David asserted. I'm not forcing you. Think about it. How long will you work at your current job? The business will afford you the flexibility to enjoy later life. His father reasoned. But. Dad. You're my only heir. If you refuse. I'll have to sell the business as I can't manage it anymore. His father stated. An undercurrent of disappointment in his voice. I didn't mean that. David's tone softened. All right then. Why not start in a month and join the business? His father proposed. Resigned. David agreed. Okay. Dad. I'll give notice at my company and wrap up my work there. Although content in his job. David understood the inevitability of eventually taking over the family business. However. The suddenness of this transition caught him off guard. Following his entry into the family business. I noticed a gradual shift in David's demeanor. He began returning home late. Spending evenings isolated on his phone. And frequently being absent during weekends. This transformation persisted for months until I couldn't ignore it any longer. Deciding it was time to confront him. David. Is everything alright with you? I queried. Concern etched in my voice. Yes, what happened? David responded. I've observed a change in your attitude over the past few months. It's concerning. I expressed. Seeking clarification. I was adamant about addressing the rift between us. Hoping to resolve it. Yet. David seemed oblivious. Brushing off my concerns. His nonchalant attitude infuriated me. Don't pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. You come home late almost every day. And when you're not late. You're glued to your phone instead of spending time with me or Eric. 
I confronted him. My frustration mounting. In a stern voice. David defended himself. This is because I'm busy. It's not like my previous job where I could finish work by 7 p.m. It's my business now. And there are responsibilities that need attention even after I come home. Coordinating with different departments over the phone is part of it. What about the weekends? I persisted. Sometimes we have work then too. David admitted. Stunned by his rationale. I needed a moment to collect my thoughts. I excused myself. Leaving the room to calm down. Although David's explanations were valid. They didn't entirely convince me. The growing distance between us perplexed me. I couldn't explain it to David. I resolved to grant him the benefit of the doubt. Allowing time for him to settle into the demands of the business. Despite our strained relationship. I acknowledged David's care for Eric. He would take time off and organize short. Getaways for Eric when I was away on business trips. Over the following two years. David's involvement in his business intensified. At times. He didn't come home at all. Although we shared a roof. Conversation between us dwindled. I often wondered if my work contributed to our growing disconnect. Loneliness crept in. And I found myself without anyone to confide in. My aging parents were in their late seventies. And I refrained from burdening them with my problems. Amidst juggling family and work. I lost touch with most friends. David's presence in my life diminished significantly. My solace came from my son. Eric. Though young. Spending time with him brought me joy and a sense of relief. Lately. I noticed Eric's distractions. His grades plummeted in monthly tests. And he seemed engrossed in video games. David. However. Indulged Eric with lavish gifts, more video games. Automatic car toys. And the like. When David attempted to bring yet another expensive video game. I resisted. Eric already has plenty of video games and toys. This new one is unnecessary. I objected. David retorted. What do you mean? Now I can't give gifts to my son. What's your problem? Eric's grades are slipping. And he's too immersed in video games. It's not conducive to his mental growth. I explained. He's my son. He'll figure it out. You don't need to worry about him. David dismissed. But he's my son too. I want to ensure he grows up educated and responsible. I persisted. Are you trying to imply I'm irresponsible? I've taken care of Eric since he was three. Years old when you left for your business trips. David countered. Stunning me with his accusation. He's the father. He has responsibilities too. I defended. Taken aback by his sudden accusation. I remembered vividly, it was he who. Volunteered to take care of Eric during my business trips. Didn't you ask me to take that promotion? You volunteered to care for Eric. David reminded me. Yes. It was me. I appreciate your support. But I've always been grateful for it. That doesn't justify your cold behavior. I responded. Emotion overwhelming me. Don't play the victim. I'm done with you. I don't owe you anything for taking care of Eric. It's your parental duty. I declared. My patience wearing thin as emotions surged. David's retort cut deep. Women like you could never be happy or keep their husbands happy. Frustrated and hurt. I couldn't contain my emotions any longer. Our exchange devolved into shouting. Each of us hurling accusations at the other. The affection and gratitude that once bound us. Seemed irreparably shattered in that heated moment. David's outburst had been unprecedented. His words cut deep. Causing an ache I had never felt before. 
he had transformed into someone unrecognizable. The sharpness of his accusations pierced my heart. And the pain was unbearable. I sought solace in the bathroom. Crying out the anguish I couldn't contain. Meanwhile. Eric. My tender-hearted son. Overheard our confrontation. Concerned when he noticed me locked in the bathroom for an extended period. He knocked on the door. His innocent voice filled with worry. Mommy. Come out. His cries tugged at my heartstrings. Gathering myself. I dried my tears and embraced him. Mommy. I was scared when you were in there for so long. He expressed. His concern evident. Oh. Honey. I was just taking a bath. I said. Trying to lighten the mood. But your hair is dry. He pointed out. A keen observer at his young age. I chuckled and ruffled his hair. Marveling at his perceptiveness. Offering spaghetti for dinner lifted his spirits. And his excitement was contagious. His smile managed to dissolve my worries. If only for that moment. Amidst this, David. Distant on the couch. Engrossed in his phone. Remained aloof to our interaction. I tended to dinner for Eric. Tucked him in bed. And prepared for my business trip the following day. Leaving a note detailing my travel plans on. David's study table had become a routine whenever. I traveled after our relationship soured. It served as a reminder for him to take care of Eric or. Arrange for his stay with my in-laws. However. During my trip. I found myself unable to focus. The recent conflicts with David lingered in my mind. Clouding my thoughts. By the second day. I started feeling unwell. Battling a rising fever and weakness. Deciding it best to cut my trip short. I contacted my manager. Explaining my condition. They promptly arranged an earlier return flight. Upon arriving home. I anticipated a comforting time with my son. Hoping to find solace in Eric's presence amidst the turmoil in my marriage. Upon my return. I noticed the house was shrouded in darkness. The main door locked. Utilizing the spare key. I unlocked the door. Ushering in light as I stepped inside. The living room lay in shadow. Prompting me to switch on the lights before heading upstairs toward Eric's room. There. I found Eric engrossed in his video games. The only source of illumination in the dim room. Hey. My love. Why are all the lights off in the house? I inquired. Puzzled by the unusual darkness. Eric's excitement at seeing me was palpable. Yet. His discomfort upon asking about his father was evident. Mommy. You're back. Yay. Where's daddy? He questioned. His unease apparent. His response was hesitant. Um. I don't know. Alarmed by Eric's behavior. I probed further. When did daddy leave? I don't know. Mommy. Dad asked me not to tell you anything. Eric replied. His anxiety growing evident. Concerned and sensing something amiss. I attempted to contact David. David. Where are you? I came for a vacation with our son. Came the unexpected reply. Shocking me to the core. The phone was on speaker. And Eric. Too. Heard every word. My heart sank. Realizing the truth in Eric's reluctance to speak. His subsequent tears signaled distress as he disclosed the painful reality. Mommy. Whenever you used to go for a trip. Daddy left me alone in the house. Eric confessed. His voice laden with sorrow. Stunned. I gathered Eric in my arms. Comforting him. As he opened up. The horrifying details emerged. 
how his father isolated him. Leaving him locked inside. With food in the fridge and video games as his only companions. Eric revealed that David came and went. Often returning late at night. Then leaving again in the morning. I couldn't fathom the distress my little son had endured in my absence. Guilt and anguish overwhelmed me. I blamed myself for leaving Eric at David's mercy. Sweetheart, why didn't you tell me earlier? I questioned Eric gently. Trying to understand the depth of his distress. Dad used to leave me alone for a few hours. But he'd bring lots of chocolates and toys for me. But now. He's gone the whole day. He made me promise not to tell you. Eric explained. Tears still streaming down his face. It's okay. Calm down. Mommy's here now. I'm sorry you had to keep that promise. You shouldn't have gone through all this. I consoled him. Feeling his pain. I'm sorry. Mommy. I got the latest video games. But I kept my promise not to tell you anything. Eric apologized. His voice quivering. It's not your fault. Baby. You're not to blame. I reassured him. My heart aching at his innocence. I couldn't bear the thought of David rewarding. Eric for concealing such a grave secret. Disgusted and disturbed. I knew staying in that house or exposing my. Child to such a man was out of the question. Without delay. We packed our bags and left. Seeking help from an investigating agency to uncover the truth about David. After ensuring Eric's safety with my aunt. I approached David's parents and recounted the distressing events. My mother-in-law struggled to believe such allegations against David. Caroline. There could be a misunderstanding. Maybe you should talk to David first before making such a big decision. Eric is young. His words might not convey the whole truth. She suggested. Her intentions sincere but lost on my overwhelming anger. Do you believe Eric is making all this up? Why would David lie about being on vacation with Eric? He might have been busy with work. She attempted to reason. But I couldn't contain my frustration any longer. This isn't an isolated incident. David has distanced himself since joining the business. Coming home late. Neglecting Eric. Spending weekends away. I poured out. Overwhelmed with emotion and disappointment. Are you suggesting that David's behavior changed because he joined his family's business? My father-in-law interjected. Breaking the tension. Brianna. Caroline is right. I never imagined David would turn out like this after joining the business. Some of my senior employees hinted at David growing closer to his assistant. My father-in-law admitted. His voice filled with regret. Why didn't you tell me about this? Brianna's shock mirrored my own sentiments. I dismissed it as mere gossip. Office rumors tend to circulate. And I believe David was too responsible to have an affair. He loved you and Eric dearly. I should have taken it more seriously. I regret it deeply. Please forgive me. Caroline. My father-in-law pleaded. His remorse palpable. Stunned into silence. I couldn't find the words to respond. Brianna seemed equally taken aback. David who held the reputation of an ideal son, husband, and father, had disappointed everyone. Despite the shocking revelation, I couldn't muster anger toward my father-in-law. Like him, I had never suspected David of having an affair. Attributing our growing distance to our demanding work schedules, I had naively hoped that once Eric grew up, David and I could rekindle our relationship in our retirement years. Presuming our parental duties and professional commitments would diminish. After leaving my in-law's house, I started receiving calls from David. Presumably prompted by my in-laws. Choosing not to engage. 
I blocked his calls. Staying temporarily with my aunt. I began house hunting. Within days. The investigating agency delivered their report. Confirming David's affair with his assistant. Lily. He would skip work. Spending entire days at her place during my business trips. With the evidence in hand. I sought legal counsel and initiated divorce proceedings. Providing photo evidence obtained from the agency. Remarkably. Lily. A single mother to a five-year-old daughter. Had herself been through a divorce due to her extramarital affair while pregnant. A detail I discovered when she applied for the job. Lily skillfully played the victim. Spinning a tale about her divorce and how she'd been wronged while pregnant to evoke sympathy. My father-in-law. Moved by her plight as a single mother despite her low qualifications. Offered her a job. Lily deceived everyone at the office. Likely feeding David the same fabricated story. However. The investigation agency unraveled her deceit. Delving into her past. Which exposed her true nature. The agency unearthed details about Lily's previous marriage. Her ex-husband divorced her without providing any financial support. Contending that the child she bore wasn't his. A DNA report further validated his claim. Revealing the truth. I transmitted these revelations to David through my attorney. Learning the reality devastated him. Prompting him to sever ties with Lily. He admitted to succumbing to her influence. Acknowledging her role in locking Eric at home. Lily justified this by claiming her own daughter. Stayed home alone while she was at work. David pleaded for reconciliation. Citing his love for Eric and his misguided actions. He confessed to the lawyer that it was Lily's idea to confine Eric. While I might have contemplated reconciliation if it were just about me. The safety and upbringing of my child became my top priority. I couldn't fathom raising Eric with a father who incentivized deceit. Despite enduring years of infidelity. I never once doubted David's loyalty. However. His betrayal shattered the trust one held. Resolute in my decision. I pursued a divorce. Unwilling to settle for anything less. Throughout this tumultuous period. My father-in-law stood by my side. Expressing remorse for David's transgressions. The news of David's affair and impending divorce became office gossip. Unable to bear the disgrace. My father-in-law expelled both David and Lily from the company. He took charge once again. Steering the company for a few years before selling it. Off to another investor for a significant sum. In an act of disinheritance. My father-in-law omitted David from his will. Redirecting the inheritance to Eric instead. David faced the repercussions of his actions. Not just in our personal life but also within his own family. His parents disowned him. Deeply hurt by the betrayal of their trust. Relocating to a different part of the city was his attempt to start anew. Although he faced societal judgment and ostracization. The neighborhood. Once a place of belonging. Now viewed him with disdain for his infidelity with his assistant. On my end. I orchestrated a change in my professional life. Opting for a transfer to a different department meant. I could manage my responsibilities at home and work more effectively. Employing a full-time nanny to assist with Eric's care. Was a deliberate decision to ensure his well-being while I focused on my career. However. I have financial stability and a well-planned future in mind. My savings have been carefully cultivated. Setting the stage for an impending retirement. The idea is to step away from the workforce. In a few years and relish life to its fullest potential. My primary aim now is to cherish every moment. And create enduring memories with my son. Eric. Looking ahead. My aspiration remains unwavering. I yearn for Eric to grow into an educated. Conscientious. 
and responsible individual. This hope drives my decisions and efforts. Intending to provide him with the best possible upbringing and guidance.